Please welcome to the stage, Frank Turner. Hi everybody, good morning. Uh, welcome to Venues Day 2022. That was good morning. It's a greeting I don't often use. I think like most of you, I got into this game so I wouldn't have to be up at this time of day. But here we are, thanks for, thanks for being here today. Um, Venues Day 2022. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. I'm honored to be standing here. I'm kind of relieved to be here. I think I can say that there were some moments, some of the darker moments in the last couple of years where the idea of there being a Venues Day in 2022 was at the very least touch or go. We made it here, I hope everyone is okay. I know that more than most people in this sector have been through some shit in the last couple of years. So welcome, I hope you're doing all right. I hope everyone you know is okay. Um, I wanna shout out to Mark and Bev and the team at the Music Venue Trust. Um, uh, four days in to the lockdowns, I was on the phone with Mark talking about what could be done at this point uh, to help. And Mark said to me, with, with a sort of rage I could hear down the phone, I'm not gonna let a single music venue close. And I said, it's nice to know they're still delivering those kinds of stimulants where you are, and could, could I have your phone number, please? Um, uh, but I mean, I think he's done an incredible job, but the whole MVT the last couple of years of keeping the sector together, united, and keeping almost all the venues open. So let's hear it from Mark and Bev and the MVT, please. Thank you. So, so Mark called me again not that long ago and asked me to be a keynote speaker today and I thought to myself he must have got quite far down his list before he called me but there is a cost of living crisis going on and you get what you pay for these days so hi that's me. Um, we all have to make do in straightened times. Um, so I agreed to do this and then Mark in his inimitable way uh, started bombarding me with frantic and persistent advice, which is his uh, modus operandi, I think. And um, he told me lots of things about what I was supposed to do with this speech, but the central message he said, he said, Turner, you've got to G him up. You've got to make him feel good, is what he said. So that's, that's my job. And, and here's the thing. Ultimately, I've done a lot of interviews about the MVT, particularly in the last two years. And the thing I always have to say is, I don't run a music venue. I've never run a music venue. I've lived at two in my time, and lots of my friends run or own music venues, but I've never been on the front lines myself. So I'm not gonna stand up here today and tell you guys uh, about facts and figures, uh, and about problems in the past, and struggles in the future, and the prospects, and all that kind of thing. You know all of that way better than I do. You're gonna talk about it all through the rest of the day. My job is to G you up, okay? <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. Um, I said I was pleased, honored, and relieved to be here, that's all true. I'm also grateful to be here um, because of the work that you guys do. This is true. Um, and here's the thing, I know this from, my, from where I stand. If you do the same thing every day as, as your job, at a certain point, it's not necessarily that you become jaded, but you get used to it and you lose a sense of the magic perhaps because it becomes routine, it becomes your job, it's the thing you do every day. And it takes somebody who doesn't do it every day but who benefits from the work that you do to remind you that what you do matters and what you do is important. Um, so that's my job today is on behalf of everybody else to say thanks to you guys for the work that you do. I'm going to talk about two quick examples here. Um, I thought I was going to have a lectern today, so I wasn't holding my notepad. No joy. Just can't get in these days. Um, uh, so I want to talk about the Joiners Arms in Southampton. Yeah, there we go. I'm from Winchester originally. I got into rock and roll when I was a kid, got into heavy metal. And my mum uh, was horrified uh, and told me I wasn't allowed to go to gigs. Uh, and then uh, I think my mum thought that gigs were basically bikers in the dark pushing drugs on young people. And she's not entirely wrong, we've all been to Rock City, but you know. Um, uh, anyway, in, in about 1995, I think, uh, luck struck. One of my mum's friends, I'm reasonably sure from her church, had a friend 
who was, uh, look at that. <laughs> I was joking, by the way, but thank you very much. Uh, one of my mum's friends uh, had a kid who was in a band who were playing a show at the Joiner's Arms, a band called Snug, if anyone remembers them. Um, the singer from Snug's mum was friends with my mum. So my mum said that me and my friend Chris could go to a gig at the Joiner's Arms. And Chris was my only ally in being into underground and independent music. He was the only person I knew who also knew who Curb Dog were. And, uh, you know, we had these faint signals. We had the John Peel show, we had Kerrang! magazine, we had Enemy if we were feeling highbrow. Uh, but generally speaking, we were the only people we knew who were into live music. And then we went down to the Joiner's Arms and it felt like an initiation into a secret club. Um, we were also, I should add, 13, so Pat, I'm sorry that you didn't check our IDs. Or, well, not sorry, actually. Um, but we went down and we went through the door of the joiners and it felt like I'd found my tribe. You know, there were other people in band t-shirts. There were other people excited to see live music. And I'd never met more than one person like that at the same time in my life. Um, so me and Chris went nuts. We pogoed all the way through Snug Set, all the way through all the support band set. And I'm pretty sure that we kept pogoing through the you know, the stereo in between the bands as well, in a way that was probably quite embarrassing. Uh, but we had this life-changing night. But from the point of view of the people running the joiners, it was a Tuesday. And as far as I can remember, there was about 50 people there. And we weren't even supposed to be there anyway, because we were too young. And for the people working the venue that night, it's another night, they'll forget about it. I'm still telling that story 27 years later. And it changed my life that Tuesday night. I went to the joiners a million more times since. I saw loads of hardcore shows there after that, Sweet Leg Johnny. I saw Kid Harpoon play there in 2007 and stole the idea of his band for my own one. I've played uh, 12 solo shows there and three shows with Million Dead. I'm into my stats, which means that I have played 0.4% of all the shows I've ever played at the joiners arms in Southampton, um, uh, including twice in one day on my 31st birthday as a benefit to buy them a new roof. It was supposed to be one gig. Pat told me that the ticket link had broken and accidentally sold two venues worth of tickets. All right, Pat. Um, anyway, so I played two shows on my birthday uh, and uh, I did one of my live streams for the Joiner's Arms as well. Um, so it's a room, it's a small room in Southampton that changed my life 27 years ago. One room. One person, huge impact, okay? It's important what you guys do. Secondly, I want to quickly talk about Nambuka, which many of you may know, and RIP as well. Hopefully, there's something happening on that level, but I'm sure you know Nambuka is a pub on the Holloway Road. I was playing in punk bands, started hanging out there socially, and discovered a community of indie kids who never went to sleep and on Sunday afternoons had a folk night called Sensible Sundays that was there because everybody had been awake since Friday and couldn't handle drums anymore. So we had an acoustic night. And at that acoustic night, I met people like Laura Marling and Florence Welsh and Mumford and & Sons and The Vaccines and Jamie T and all these people. Um, and, you know, we, we learned about folk music and I learned about what I do now. Um, to pick an example of the kind of place that was, on the 24th of March, 2008, there was a gig at Nambuka called Van Aid, right? Is Ali Wolf here today, Ali? No, he's not here, good, I can talk about him. Ali runs the Clapham Grand these days. Uh, in 2008, he was tour managing a band called Captain Black, who were based at Nambuka, and he crashed their van, and he didn't have insurance. So they needed a new van, so he set up a gig called Van Aid at Nambuka and all day, all the money going towards replacing this van. The lineup included the Holloways, me, Kira Hader, who now writes songs uh, for lots of other people, uh, Dan Smith, who's now part of Pompeii, it is Pompeii, Beans on Toast, Mumford and Sons, uh, Justin from the Vaccines was there, um, uh, Ali, who now runs the Gram, was there, Kid Harpoon was there, who now just wrote Harry Styles' new album, um, my friend Tree was there, who's now been my tour manager for more than 10 years, my friend Dave was there, who was the best man in my wedding, who's been a promoter's rep for the same amount of time, my friend Steve was there, who now lectures in economics at Liverpool, but let's not worry about that. Anyway, th my point being, there was a, an amazing cast of people. We were young, we, were, we never went to bed, we didn't know what we were doing, and we had this space 
in which to experiment with ourselves and with our culture and with our organization. So that's one venue, one day, 14 years ago, and the number of people that affected is almost immeasurable. And I wrote a song that mentions the word Nambuka, and I've played that song and watched people sing along with it in 48 different countries, and every single time people ask me, what does that word mean? Is it a type of drink? Anyway, uh, so, you know, there we go. We've got the joiner's arms. We've got Nambuka. We've got two rooms that just for me personally has changed my life, made me the person I am. Uh, and the people running those venues, did they notice that as it happened? I don't know. Probably not. But they should do. Or at least today we should take a moment to, uh, to celebrate that. That's two venues. The Music Venue Trust represents 950 independent grassroots music venues. You can do the maths on that, but that's a lot of people's lives affected, potentially. So yeah, so I'm here to say that what you do matters, and to say thank you and to express gratitude. Two final things. Um, by definition, the corner of culture that we occupy is a noisy one, right? It involves PAs and loud music and, as we all know, noise complaints and issues with the council. Um, but uh, it's a noisy type of culture, and by definition, therefore, it needs a place in which to exist. And as we've learned painfully in the last couple of years, if you take that place away, the culture just kind of dies off. And by providing a place, a platform, a forum for this culture to exist, you allow it to exist full stop. Without it, there's nothing. It's that simple. And I can stand here and do the thing I do in interviews over and over again and recite the list of big acts who've got, who come up through indie venues, Adele, Ed Sheeran, Biffy Claro, Radiohead, Oasis, Coldplay, whatever. Um, and that's all well and good, and it's true, and it's, in, it's increased the GDP, and it's a successful export, and all the facts and figures. But you know what else? There's also decades of small underground bands, independent scenes, promoters, um, DJs, all the rest of it, who exist in your spaces, who aren't going to go on and sell out Wembley Arena or whatever it might be, and they are just as important and just as valid and just as vital to our culture and deserve just as much recognition as the people at the top of the masthead, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to talk about today is those moments of transcendence, you know, those moments when you find yourself in a gig and yes, your foot is stuck to the floor and yes, you're drinking something awful, but you're surrounded by people you don't know and either discovering each other singing along to your new favorite band or with your friends discovering a band you never heard of or even laughing at someone be awful. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't really matter. These moments of community and transcendence, they need a space in which to happen. And that brings me to my second point, which is broader which is that I think that it's safe to say that one of the things that has been highlighted in the last couple of years is that we're social animals and that we need to commune with each other, we need to be with each other, we need to express ourselves in each other's company. And you can take that away for a period of time, but it's disastrous for us as a species, I think, you know? We talk about the damage done to kids being taken out of school, but we're all kids ultimately. And, you know, I'm gonna quote Joni Mitchell, I can't avoid it. You don't know what you got till it's gone. In the last couple of years, the thing that I missed was that sense of gathering, that sense of society and of community that you find, that I have in my life found at independent grassroots music venues. I missed it. You guys provided it before. You provide it now. Thank you very, very much for that. Okay? Um, so ultimately, is the culture that we represent in this room for everybody? Probably not. It's for lots of people. It could be for more. I know a lot of people are working on kind of issues to do with diversity, disabled access, and that kind of thing, spreading the joy. But it's important to us in this room, and we're allowed to celebrate that. Does this culture change the world? Probably not, but it changes people. It changed me. It changed my life. It defined my life. It made me the person I am today, and I suspect that that's true for everyone in this room. And without these rooms, it wouldn't have happened. Okay? So... To wrap up, to all of the owners, the managers, the promoters, the bar staff, the security, the sound guys, all the rest, everybody who works at independent grassroots music venues, from the musicians, the touring crew, 
the sound guys, the van drivers, the roadies, the techs, the publishers, the publicists, the label people, the a &R guys, the photographers, the DJs, the journalists, the zine writers, the DJs, the regular punters, the drinkers, the straight edge kids, the underage 13 year olds, all the way up to the old men wearing Iron Maiden jackets, standing at the back complaining that it's not like it used to be. Thank you very much. <laughs>